Hi everybody, Colin Stevenson here. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm joined with my hero, my sensei, John Lenhart. Hey, John. Hey. Now, tonight we're so excited because this has been our favourite subject since the beginning, next to love and truth and, and happiness and all these other wonderful things that we've spoken about. But psychology, literally you can relate to every single one of these uh, topics that we've spoken about. And if we don't have the full one to 10 ratio and we're missing a couple of parts, maybe parts one and two, which is like the cause and, and the science behind everything, um, I don't believe there's enough science behind psychology. I believe it's too theoretical and there's a lot of it plucked out from nowhere. Now, John, I know he's itching to come on and speak to us about it. John has the science, he has the model for the mind and brain, and he's able to explain in depth um, the science behind it. So John, please tell us more. Okay, so we always like to start with definitions. Psychology, the definition of psychology is the scientific study of the human mind and its functions, especially those affecting behavior in a given context. So right there, we talked about truth or principles that apply to any context. Already this definition, it's interesting. The definition says it's a scientific study. That's awesome. I love that. Human mind, how it operates, and especially behavior in a specific context. And that is where, when we talked about the model last time, they're now a step away from truth. They're now dealing with the context. So that sounds all well and good, but I talked about this last time. So I mentioned this book. Yeah. So this book was written, I believe it's two or three years ago. And we actually quoted this in the LinkedIn, but I want to read you the passage. This is why this book was written. This, this guy says, after spending 15 years in psychology and its cousin, cognitive neuroscience, I have nevertheless reached an unsettling conclusion. If we continue as we are, then psychology will diminish as a reputable science and could very well disappear. If we ignore the warning signs now, then in a hundred years or less, psychology may re be regarded as one in a long line of quaint scholarly indulgences, much as we now regard alchemy or phrenology, you know, study of bumps in the head. So he wrote this book to say, everybody, Psychology is about to go away. It is not a science. It is not being done according to science. We can't replicate the most famous psychological experiments. And one of the complaints I get against me and what I've learned is he even brings up these papers and these peer reviews, they're not helping the science. So the, the issue is psychology is in danger of being proven to not be a science. And so the way I like to say it to people is I'll say to them, would you pay a mechanic to fix your car if he didn't understand how a car worked? And everybody goes, no. Well, we just gave you the definition of psychology, the understanding the human mind, and I'd say mind and brain are two different things. The human mind and brain, what's their model? What's their explanation for how it works? They don't have one. They do not have a model. We talked a little bit about this in part one. So that's the issue right now, is there is no model, there is no science, and people are aware that psychology is in danger of going away and being exposed for not being a science. Oh, right, okay, so you've touched on so much there, but what I would like to touch on there is, is you've got the stages one and two, and that's the understanding of the mind and brain so that psychology can come in and, and yes it can fix things I, i'm not taking anything away from psychologists or psychology it's there for a reason but i do want to ask you a question though can people just say things you know like so theoretical so the theory can come from thin air or because one person wants to program a society or one person wants to allow people to feel maybe diminishing mental health because I don't believe the psychology that we have just now and how it's being used is helping people. So it could be not, not conspiracy theorist. Okay. Not conspiracy theorist, 
just with somebody looking out from the outside in, okay, not from the inside out, from looking from the outside in, I believe that the, the psychologists and the therapists are now the new drug dealers of the world. People have to go and get their fix, okay? Now, in order to do that, surely you would be giving some sort of disinformation or not enough information to allow things to get that way. Right. So this is the way I, I've been seeing it lately to explain what that issue is with not having a model and, and this disinformation. There are people out there who are really, really upset and passionate about not one person dying from COVID. I deal a lot with the schools. So there are people out there going, why is school in session? Somebody could die from COVID. I believe the reason they're so passionate about that is they believe it's preventable. People dying from COVID is preventable. So what they're saying is, is if I don't say something and someone dies from COVID, I'm going to feel guilty. So I, I get that. I believe the reason those same people don't give a crap about the hundreds and thousands of middle school and, and high school kids that are killing themselves every year, because they're worried about one person dying of COVID and they don't care about all the people who are dying from mental health issues. And the reason is, is they don't believe they can fix it. They don't believe that problem is able to be dissolved which says a lot about where we are with psychology. Yeah. We don't believe that we can get rid of the problem of depression or the problem of suicide, but we can, we can wear a mask and handle this COVID thing. Now, here's the problem. If you don't believe you can fix this problem, you also don't believe you can make it worse. And so these people that are so passionate about, let's get the kids out of there, let's, let's isolate the kids, let's have them sit in their bedroom and do school from their bedroom. So now in their mind, their bedroom is school, which they're never gonna get away from, is gonna wear them out. And then when they go back into school, they're gonna think school is their bedroom and they're gonna have twice as many behaviors. The reason why is people don't think they can do anything wrong. And what we're gonna eventually learn is this strategy about worrying about a person dying physically from COVID caused us to take a step that's gonna cause tens or hundreds of people to end up dying. And that's where we are with psychology. We really, when you look around, we really don't believe we can fix depression and suicide, but we could fix that car. Yeah. You can fix the car because we know how it works, but we can't fix this person because we don't have a model for the mind and the brain. And that's what I wanted to share with you today about how I came about with yeah. my model. Now, just before we go on to that, because I am sure everyone's very, very interested and they'll all be actually biting their nails now because of the like, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? But that's fine, okay? Now, the first conversation that we had was you asking me a question and on my definition. We then had our first Zoom call and we spoke. And I, I do believe and I do recall having the conversation about depression, anxiety and all these things. I My words to you were that I don't believe in them. <laughs> right? I told you I don't believe in depression. I don't believe in anxiety. I don't believe in, in certain things, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that I know for a fact they can be fixed. However, I didn't know how to do it until I met you, where you actually gave me the information on how to fix the cause and not the effects. And this is why, obviously, we're having this conversation now. So please tell me or, and, and tell everybody else that's watching about how you came up with the model, please. Right, so I will provide a link that'll give you all the data. So I'm just gonna give the story and, and kind of rough it out. And I'm not gonna sit here and show you graphs or anything. But basically what happened was 25 years ago, I was given a project. I was working for a company that made an air freshener that plugged into the wall. The air freshener worked for 45 days, but people said they couldn't smell it after 21 days. So there's two things to realize here. Adaptation 
is 21 minutes after walking into a room, you cannot smell that room again, no matter how hard you try. So we see this all the time. You walk into a room, it smells a certain way, and after 21 minutes, you can't smell the room anymore. Habituation is 21 times of walking into a room, you will no longer be able to smell it. Think about it. I've come over your house, you can't smell your house, I can smell your house. No matter how hard you try, you can't smell your house. So what is going on there? And that's what I was tasked to learn, was, is what was going on. So I came up with, it turned out, it took 11 models to figure out how the human brain and the human nose are connected and why our brain zeroes that out. And the analogy I gave for this is, imagine a guy walking up to his girlfriend's door for their first date, and around the door there are lilacs. He smells the lilacs, and what happens is, is every fragrance tends to be what we call seven accords or seven notes. The first time you smell anything, unless you're an expert, you can only get four notes. So he smells the smell. Now, the, the fragrance is at 100% strength. When he smells it, because he doesn't fully understand it, he smells something at 60%. Reality is 100. He experiences 60 the next time he walks up to her door, and let's just say it stays at 100, he smells it. His brain does a profile, let's say does a profile, and his brain pulls up the previous profile. If the previous profile doesn't match, he's allowed to smell it, and this becomes the new profile. So now he smells it at 70%. He does it again, 80%, 90, 100. After five days, he will smell the fragrance. It will take him five days to learn that smell. And at five days, he is fully experiencing reality. So notice, the first four days, the fragrance was at 100%, and he wasn't experiencing 100%. He actually thought the fragrance was getting stronger. After the fifth day, when it matches what he smells, his brain, the next time he walks in, his brain pulls up the, he smells it, his brain pulls up the profile, it matches, and now his brain lessens the smell. The brain has mastered the smell, and the brain has lessened it down to 90%, and keeps taking it down till 21 days from the first time, the brain zeroes out the fragrance, and he's never able to smell it. So we had people with this air freshener who, who would call up and say, I can't smell my air freshener. And I'd say, where is it? And they'd say, in the kitchen. And I'd say, could you move it to your living room? And they're like, wait a minute. My kitchen is smaller than my living room, and this thing is dead. Do you really think I'm going to smell it in a bigger room? I said, move it. They move it. They call up you know, a day or two later. They can smell it again. This is not about reality. So the first thing I learned is our brains are not made to fully experience reality. Notice in that, in that 45 days, there's only one day that you fully experience reality. It's on that fifth day. So if, you're, if your brain was made to fully experience reality and you've experienced reality for 45 days and you only experience it one day, how can you say your brain was made for reality? It's not. And that's the thing. All these people who are coaches, all these people are consultants, they all believe in the conscious brain. They all believe in fully experienced reality. And the more you experience reality, the happier you're going to be. No, and that's when, when I realized this 25 years ago, I'm like, everybody's got the model for the brain wrong. Everybody thinks that our brain is made to fully experience reality. And the more you experience reality, the happier you'll be. Here's the thing, is when you look at the charts and stuff, happiness the person is happy the first day, they're happy the second day, they're happy the third day, they're happy the fourth day, they're happy the fifth day. They're 90% happy the sixth day, and they may even be happy the seventh day, like 85%, and then after that, they're mad. Our brains are made to be happy. Our brains are made for happiness. And if we can stay in that learning phase, those first five days are the learning phase. As you're learning something, 
you experience this happiness. The minute you master something, your brain actively wipes it out. So if you can keep yourself in the, in the learning phase, you could always be happy. Yeah. Now, when you look at the charts, and this will be a topic for another time we'll get into, but when you look at the charts, I instantly saw there are four phases or four gears. There's a learning phase. There's one day when you experience reality. There's a bunch of days when you're decreasing reality and there's you experience no reality. And I realized the brain has four thought processes. Yeah. Psychology has a name for the last thought process. It's called dysregulation. Psychology has a name for when it's deteriorating, regulation. Psychology has a name for this one moment, self-regulation. Psychology does not have a name for this learning phase. And this is where happiness occurs. And, and I'll jump to the end. Flow is toggling between the learning phase and, and consciousness. So that 80 phase, I call it 80, that consciousness phase is resiliency. So people work their way up to resiliency and then they try to double work their way up and wear themselves out. You've got to work your way up to resiliency and then be able to move into the learning phase. And flow is doing this. If you do this, your brain will heal itself. You'll have all this energy and you'll be happy because every time you were happy, you flowed. So that's what I did is, is 25 years ago, I had the understanding that everybody's model for the brain was conscious and try to be at this fully experienced reality. And, and the thing is, is we're never happy when we fully experience reality. We're happier than when we're not, but we are only happy when we're giving up control and flowing. And that was something, because what happened was it got declared a trade secret. My model for the, for the brain and the nose got declared a trade secret. And for 20 years, I couldn't share it with anybody, but I had this understanding. And so I kept working on this model for the mind and the brain, which was the previous episode I shared when I shared it with psychology professor. But that's what I had was 25 years ago, I was the only person in the world who understood the brain worked backwards. And ever since then, all these studies that have come out, I basically predicted because medical science is realizing more and more that our model for the brain is just totally wrong. It's like a computer. We're trying to say, the more you know, the more you understand, the more conscious you are, the happier you're going to be. No, you're going to wear yourself out. And the Harvard Business Review had an article that said, the more you focus, the more you lose energy, and then the more you lose self-control. The yeah. only healthy thought process is flow. Yeah. Now, I'm now a flow guy since I met you, okay? I am now a flow guy since I met you, and I would like to put a bit of personal experience in this before, before we cut off. But what happened was, before I was too focused on where I was going, what I was doing, what I wanted, what I didn't want, and because whatever I was doing, whether it was right, wrong, indifferent, I was losing energy because I was putting too much into it. And I always ask myself, why am I losing energy? Why am I not enjoying this? I really want to do this because this is going to allow me to be free and be happy and all these crazy thoughts in my head. Then it got to a point where I, I lost my smell, right? Now, this is where it's very interesting that you're talking about this. I, when I was in the military, I joined the boxing team, and I, I, I wasn't a fighter. I'm still not a fighter. I just know how to box a bit better now, right? And I, I had my nose damaged so that I'm not able to taste or smell anything. Now, that caused my mental health to, to slide, as it would for any normal person that's used to having such an ability and then not to have it anymore. And I, I got out of the army and, and I came back and, you know, it took me to this point of where do I want to go, what do I want to do? And I decided to let go, right? And because I decided to let go, I started becoming happy because I was going through life and I was learning short small things to like this no i don't but now i've got that knowledge and now i'm able to do this and and i was picking up in different a lot of intangible things as well it wasn't all just tangible things that i was picking up there's a lot going on with my own head and feelings and consciousness and stuff like that as well at the time and this allowed me to grow to a certain degree where i was like no i am actually happy all the time now i didn't need to go for help I didn't need to, to go over and do shadow work and trauma work and 
hours and hours of therapy and all these things. What I did was just exactly what you just explained. Now, you and I don't obviously talk before we do our videos. We just flow, which is amazing. But everything that you said just spoke through my story. And basically, it took me to lose my sense of smell and taste so I couldn't feel habitual or, or any of these situations. I couldn't feel comfortable. So I then had to go and focus on other things. And this is what brought me out. Right. And the thing, the, the thing about your story that's really important, because a lot of people hear that story and think, oh, I just need to go control. You spent years and years and years getting to this conscious, getting to this effort and everything. So if you just, if a person hears this and just goes, I'm just going to let go. Yeah. No, 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 no. You first have got to put the work in. So I'm not against all these people talking about resiliency. I'm not against all these people talking about getting coaching and effort. You have to do that in order to flow. But once you've done that, doing that more is going to hurt you. So you do all that stuff, resiliency and everything, and then you got to learn how to give up control the right way into who you are. So there is two steps there. You did that. So your story is you efforting and doing all this and then giving up control. And that's why you did this by experience. I wrote an article about conjunctives and how you are on this one end and you, the truth, you come at the truth into a conjunctive from two different ways. The reason you and I bonded is I came at the truth here with this theory. You came at the truth with experience. And when we started talking, you're like, I know this, meaning I feel it and I'm convinced of it, but I can't explain it. And I kept smiling going, I can explain it if you want to hear it. And most people, Colin, don't want to hear it. Most people are like, I don't want to hear you explain what I'm doing naturally because it's going to wreck it. And I'm like, okay. But when you were like, no, I want to understand this. When I explained it to you, you were like, I'm already doing this. I, you basically said, I did this without you, John, but now I know how to do it on purpose. And now I know what I've done. And now I know how to help other people do it. Yeah. And that's what I do. You don't need to listen to me in order to flow because people have been able to flow for centuries without talking to me. Yeah. But I can help you flow on purpose. And I challenge anybody else out there to explain their method for how to do it. Even these guys who are world flow experts say to just do it from experience or they don't explain it. They just explain the effects. So that's what I do is I intentionally help people flow or I take people like you, Colin, who already flow and I show you what you did so you can flow in every area of your life. Yeah. Wouldn't you like to flow in everything? You flow in certain things. Wouldn't you like to flow in everything? That's what I do. Yeah, and it's honestly, uh, you changed my life in a way that I'll always be grateful for and in a way that I'll never be able to quite explain to people. Um, I have always had friends uh, that have been well-educated and, you know, they, they are psychologists and, and lawyers and doctors and I've been surrounded with these people all my life. And as much as they're important and they're clever and they have all these things going about them, I've never had anyone blow my mind before and tell me what I already knew <laughs> and, and why I knew it. It was, just, it was just fantastic. So literally, just to finish this up, John, it, the people watching this just now, and, and, and I hope psychologists do watch this, what, what would your message be to them um, based on what we've just said? So I would have two messages to them. Number one, I am talking about adding something to what you're already trying to do. You're already trying to get effort, discipline, in control. The thing is, is that a lot of people's lives are out of control. Flow means you have to give up control. You can't give up control if you're out of control. You first have to get in control in order to give up control. So I am completely supportive with everybody out there who is helping out of control people get in control. But if you think that getting in control is the end of the road, you're going to end up back out of control. So I'd like to add on top of everything you're doing this other step. Second of all, psychologists, and I'm working with a psychologist that you introduced me to, and, yeah. and today the, they made the perfect comment. They said, I already knew this, but I didn't know this. Everything they were doing now, they're looking at this model, they're going through the course, 
and everything they've ever done and everything they felt like doing the right way is clicking. They know why. And now they're excited. And now they're like, I can intentionally help people. It's not, I'm just hoping to look for something. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm trying to do. So I would say, I think it's great that someone's a psychologist because they have all this background. They have all this understanding. They have all this experience. How would you like all the tools you have to be able to apply perfectly every time you use them instead of hoping they work? That's what I would say. So I'm not against psychologists. I think it's great they've learned all this stuff. But the <laughs> issue is, is, and I'd like to close with this, with this story. Um, when I share my model, and I said this last time, when I share my model with people who are professionals, like psychologists or doctors, they know enough not to ad hominem me, go, you're not even a psychologist, what do you know? And they know not to ad populum me, going, well, if you were right, why didn't anybody do it? But the thing is, is that I'm always shocked that they lack a growth mindset. And the, the story I tell about that is, when my son was seven years old, he thought he was the world's greatest burper. He could burp for 10 seconds and he thought he was the best. And I was coaching a guy who was a recording artist. And my son looked up to the guy and said, you know, I'm the, I'm the world's greatest burp. I'm great. And this guy said, you know, I know how to burp pretty well too. And my son's like, let's have a contest next week. So the guy comes over. My son wants to have the contest. He goes, let me meet with your dad first. We meet. When we're done, my son's got two cans of root beer sitting out and he's ready for this contest. And this guy goes, look, I've been meeting with your dad. Can I do a practice? It won't count. I'm just going to take a drink. I'm going to do a practice. My son goes, sure. He takes a drink and he proceeds to burp for a full minute. <laughs> when he was done, we looked at my son and my son, it looked like someone shot his dog. He's just like, he just walked up. He put his root beer on the table, turned around and walked out the door. And I like to say this. If my son, my seven-year-old son was growth mindset, what would he have said to this recording artist? He would have asked how he managed to do it for a minute. Teach me. <laughs> I am shocked that I've only met one growth mindset psychologist. And that was my good friend who I introduced you to. And I believe that she will be a trailblazer within the, the psychology industry if you want to call it that or the psychology science whatever i believe that she's going to take things to a new level and i also believe that other people should should follow suit and be their best if they're doing really good and they're the best at the moment they can be even better and they can really help people the way they need to be helped and not just the way that they think they should be helped fantastic so john I'm very excited about this and I'm very excited about the next one as well, part three. So thank you so much again and I look forward to speaking to you soon. Take care. Bye.